played an instrument in our house but um, my father was very into musical comedies so we had a lot of musical comedy albums around lots of which I've actually still got. South can, Pacific, can, Oklahoma. South Pacific, Oklahoma, Mame, Sweet Charity, uh, you know anything with Julie Andrews or Barbara Streisand or Judy Garland, Liza Minnelli, I mean I had them all. I used to beg my mother to get singing lessons and she'd always say, no, your voice is not mature enough. No, you have to wait, you have to wait. The first album that I bought was Simon and Garfunkel, Greatest Hits. It was a great record. And then would have followed up closely with Carole King and... and uh, Tapestry. Tapestry, of course. And uh, those sort of singer-songwriter records I was really fond of. Then at about 16, I discovered Joni Mitchell. 15 or 16, and I was in love. She was incredible. She's a goddess, and she, you know, she's still extraordinary. I've seen Deborah act in quite a few things. In a male dominated world. Yes, and, he he and she's absolutely magnetic. You can't take your eyes off her. She's always been very beautiful and she actually started off uh, modelling for Big M and knitting patterns. I don't think she'd be really too happy with me reminding her of knitting patterns on national television, but oh, too late, I just did it. <laughs> For someone who liked singing as much as I did, it never actually occurred to me that I could join a band and be a singer in a band. Someone else said, hey, why don't you join a band? So I put an ad in the paper. I was 20 years old at the time and somebody rang up, actually two people rang up. And I went to this audition and immediately got the job because everyone else was, you know, had beards and beer guts. And, um, and then somebody else also wanted me to join their band, so I was you know, flooded with offers. It was fantastic. I didn't really plan on a solo career. It was sort of something that happened to me as opposed to something that I'd engineered. Dore and me had gone to London, or to England, and we had written and recorded demos for Virgin, and at some point after we'd given them the demos, they said, look, we, we don't really want a third Doremi album at this stage. Why don't, you know, De Deborah, why don't you make a solo record first and then we'll talk about the third album. I'm still flying, flag for you. Blue heart, red eyes and white roses. It's true. I heard about this uh, girl in this band that was stunningly beautiful and uh, I think a lot of people were quite surprised that she packed a bit of a punch. Spell the end of everything fine. She certainly uh, made a bit of a mark around town but uh, she was determined to do it uh, her way and uh, on her terms even back then. Don't send me them you sent The ones I'd say were through She rang me and asked me would I like to be in the video clip for It's Only the Beginning. And I'm sorry, but the only person who could look good in tartan golf pants is Deborah Conway. And uh, I chickened out. And I look back at it now and I think, I feel sad that I'm not in the video, but I think I'm right. She looked a lot better in tartan golf pants than I was ever going to. Walking along the river. 
I haven't been outspoken about certain matters to do with image and the visuals. And I was never a very big fan of daytime film clips. And, uh, you know, I just thought that Deborah really could have depicted herself uh, in a much sexier, more glamorous light. And yet, uh, I hear mainly from women how sexy and glamorous she looked in that video. So, uh, I guess really, looking back in time, she was mostly correct and it was a fun video, but not the sort of video I would imagine was a real turn on to the boys, a girl on a golf course. So Deborah's always been a really independent person. A lot of people would have been happy if she'd worn a frock and shaved her armpits and, you know, gotten Joe Bailey to do her hair or something. But she was never going to do that. I think Deborah felt that to be taken seriously as a musician, uh, she needed to play down her beauty, but I think that was her own way of anti started and trying to prove a point, but I mean, you know, Deborah's still Thanks a very, very beautiful girl and I think really with the words and the moods that Deborah Conway, you know, brought to music, I mean, she was ahead of her time. My love can dream of me. People like Deborah are the kinds of people who, you know, break genres down. You know, I'm able to work with her. Um, you know, Michael Nyman can work with her. Willie Ziggier can work with her. She can also do a Patsy Cline show. So, I mean, she's a person who's able to do many things while retaining essentially what she is, which is a damn fine singer. Crazy. I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. I think Deborah was always a very creative person and always worked with interesting groups. Blue heart, red eyes, and white roses. But obviously, you know, when she met Willie, uh, Willie was bringing a completely different perspective on music to Deborah, and she was clearly open to that. I employed Willie as the guitar player after I'd made String of Pearls. So he was, you know, going to be the touring guitar player. He'd been recommended by Richard Pleasance and also by a few other people who had all said, oh, you've got to get this guy, he's an amazing guitarist. I've had a different musical career to Deborah. I'm a trained musician. I studied, went to the conservatorium, did classical guitar, decided I wanted to have no truck with that world, so left it alone. Became a, a jazz musician. Played with Vince Jones and Wilbur Wilde and Paul Grabowski. Did that for a number of years and then decided, hmm, I don't know if I want to do this either. And then I uh, started writing songs and being a pop musician playing in alternative Melbourne bands. And then Deborah got to hear about me and employed me as her guitar player. When it's all in the beginning, we can bring the house down every night. This could be the so I rang him up and, um, and he said it's only the beginning was already out there and it was already a radio hit and people were, were loving it and stuff. So there was no there was no issue that it was going to be an, a long running tour and he said oh he couldn't do it because he had this show that um, was a week into our tour and I thought well, that's bold <laughs> I think I want this guy anyway well yes that's true actually because my little art band had you know one or two shows so I said Deborah I can't do your tour so um, I put my tour off I put my tour back for him and uh, got him to come round to my house and and here we uh, are three children later mm, there we go There's no choices, you have to um, fit them both in. I have to look after my children. I won't be able to afford their psychiatric bills later when it comes around. Should we wake up the squirrels? Like 
stage, Willie has to stay home now. We did tour for a long time when we had one child and then when we had two children, but three children, it's impossible. Something's right. Something's right. The new album is much more sunny, affirmative, poppy, possibly reflective of the fact that they now have three young children growing up who want to listen to their CDs. I think there's probably, you know, a wonderful kind of youthfulness and almost a nostalgia for pop, you could say, which is coming out in this new album. And they do it well, so good luck to them. I think the last few records that we've made have been relentlessly modern and harsh and brittle sounding. And um, we're the sort of people who constantly like to surprise ourselves and challenge ourselves. And so we just made a complete break with what we had done. It's a modern take on that late 60s, early 70s music. I've always steered away in the past from writing happy songs because it always seemed too hard. It was much easier to be melancholy and blue. But it's interesting because um, I really wanted to write something warm, optimistic, empowering, that sort of, sort of you know, daggy hippie sort of stuff. But I mean, it was, uh, it was kind of a mantra for me, you know, optimistic empowerment, optimistic empowerment. So, you know, I'd come in and start writing something and went, no, it's not happy enough. But um, it was actually incredibly easy to do. When I'm with you, time disappears somewhere. I think songwriting is one of the most intimate pastimes that I can engage in. For me, I mean, I know plenty of people do write songs with people that they don't know. And I've done it on a few occasions, but I'm, I'm always a little bit guarded. Often as not, we just put aside time to write. We have to be very disciplined in our lives because of our children. I think in order to write a good song, you have to expose yourself and you have to be really, really honest. And it's not necessarily autobiographical, but at some point it has to be, it has to touch on a core truth in order to touch the person that's listening to it. Please, what can I do to help us heal? What can I say to make this clear? Let's save the tears and take a last chance. Tell me about the recording of the CD. The recording of the CD. Well, my parents uh, like to go away on holiday. <laughs> and uh, they had three holidays last year. And as they announced to me their third trip, I was, I was a bit cross. I was grumbling because they were running away from their babysitting duties. And then I thought, a little light went on, and I thought, gee, empty house, recording studio. So on October the 6th, they left the house at 12.30 and at 1.30 we pulled a van up outside their house full of studio gear and set up a studio in the living room and dining room. It was great. And you felt like a naughty teenager? I felt like a naughty teenager for the entire time. Summerwear is the name of the idea. We've taken it from the Tupperware idea. If you buy 25 copies of the album, off the website, then uh, Willie and I come to your house to deliver them, sign them, and play a 20 minute set. It's a marketing idea, it's a novelty idea, as opposed to, you know, world domination lounge room by lounge room. But, you know, hey, it's a start. I like the idea, I like the, the fact that it's incredibly confronting and intimate. Meeting people on their home turf, and it's very strange for them, it's very strange for us. You know, I just wish that she would have done uh, gigs at anyone's houses for me with, that bought 25 albums. It was fantastic. It's fun, isn't I'm it? I'm totally streamlined now. I've got rid of 
managers, publishers, record companies. It's just, I don't know. I mean, there's no, there's no um, breakdown in communication between the manager and the artist these days. What happens in Australia, of course, if you are being an individual and setting your own path, you know, you're not going to get that massive airplay. To have been independent is uh, probably as good as it gets. Although I'm sure she wouldn't mind some more money <laughs> and, you know, a big commercial success. I mean, all of us would like that, but that will not change her. I will try. I mean, she's a, you know, one of the greatest singers that we have in, you know, across genres, really. She's one of our great singers in, in this country. She really craved success, but in her own hip way, she sort of fought commercial success and tried to in a way hamper herself which was a shame because she's one of the great songwriting talents she's always liked to entertain and amuse and uh, be controversial it's not an act it's not something that she does just for effect that's deborah her intelligence and her voice it's a pretty heady combination